Hi everyone! Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream uh, on our last night here of our virtual Dark Sky Caravan. Um, I am Jessica, I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is Lindsay, who I will let introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lindsay, I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. So for our last night of our caravan, uh, virtual caravan, we're going to be taking you um, to see some other types of objects that we can find in our dark skies. Because um, we've talked a bit about like the moon and the planets um, and stars and telescopes and astrophotography. And we want to take it a little bit further to something slightly more, I won't say advanced, I'll say intermediate, um, and finding some of these other objects. Um, so with that, I'm going to get switched over. Um, if you have any questions throughout, um, feel free to leave them in the comments below, and we will answer them um, as they come up. All right. Um, sorry, this is what happens when I try and do things at once. Okay. All right. So our show tonight is um, about these things called Messier objects. Um, and there are 110 of them, as you can see here. Um, these are a set of 110 deep space objects. And by that, we mean um, things that are outside of our solar system. And they were cataloged by a man named Charles Messier, who we'll get to in a second. That's why it's called the Messier Catalog. And if you've ever heard of astronomers or someone uh, describe an object by calling it M and then a number, like M13, M34, you know, M101, anything like that, that's what they're talking about is these objects in the Messier Catalog. Messier catalog. Um, the M stands for Messier, and then the number is the number the object is in that catalog. It's just kind of a shorthand to make it easier to kind of discuss these things. Um, and these are all pretty bright objects. Um, some of them can be seen with the naked eye, but most uh, you do need at least a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, something as small as a four inch telescope will do. And we did do a whole show about that on Tuesday. If you're interested in kind of how to get started using a telescope, what to look for, what to buy, you can go watch Tuesday's show and it'll tell you all about that. Um, but these are also all objects that are in the northern hemisphere. Um, so they are visible to us here, and that's because um, Messier was French. He's in the northern hemisphere, and so these are objects that he could see. Um, now, a lot of these objects, as I said, cannot be seen with the naked eye which makes them a little bit harder to find, which is why I place these at a bit more intermediate level than kind of a beginner level object. And so in order to find them, you really have to be able to read a star chart like the one that's here. Now this is a full sky chart, so it's kind of busy, pretty complicated. Uh, this may look a little scary, but don't worry. I'm going to kind of tell you how you can use this throughout the show. And most of the times you can find smaller versions of just the area you want to look at that are much less complicated. And we'll, we'll get into all of that. Um, so as I said, the Messier catalog was created by Charles Messier, who is a French astronomer. That's him on the left. Um, and he was actually not looking for these objects. He was looking for comets, but he kept finding all of these other things that weren't comets and kept frustrating him because he would, you know, look and think, oh, maybe, oh wait, no, that's that fuzzy thing I've already seen. That's not a comet. Uh, and so he started making a list of all of these frustrating objects that, um, he wanted to make sure that he knew what they were, where they were, and that, more importantly, they weren't comets. Um, and so he was assisted by uh, Pierre, I'm not going to be able to say his name, Machine. I, I, sorry, 
um, we'll say Pierre, who is on the right here. Um, and they ended up putting together um, a catalog of about 45 objects. That was the first version of this. Um, about 18 of those were actual discoveries made by Messier and Pierre. Um, and the rest were things that had already been found, but he included them on this list. And then over the years, um, more objects were found by himself and other astronomers. So about 10 years later, the list expanded to 103 objects. Um, and then uh, over the years, a few more were added to bring it up to today's total of 110. And of the Messier objects, there are a good variety of different types of objects. Um, and so what we're going to do first is kind of give you an overview of the different types of objects uh, that are in this catalog. And then at the end, we'll show you specifically some that you can find up in the sky now and really t uh, teach you how you could find these for yourself. So we're going to get started with a uh, type of object called an open star cluster. So this is a group of stars. Um, open clusters tend to be um, a bit smaller, containing a um, few hundred up to maybe a few thousand stars that are loosely grouped together. They also tend to have a kind of bluish tint to them. And that's because these are younger populations of stars. And so we have a lot of these bright blue stars that outshine everything else, but they don't live very long. And so that's why we know it's a young population, because if those blue stars are there, it has to be young because those things die very quickly. Um, but they, they dominate the light coming from it. Now, what we have here is the kind of classic example of an open cluster. This is the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. Um, and I will mention here that the pictures that we're going to be showing to start with are not what you would see with your eye. These are the very, very pretty professional pictures. Um, but later on, when I show you the things that you can find in the sky right now, um, I'll show you more uh, pictures that are more like what you would actually see looking through a smaller telescope. Um, but the Pleiades here are up in the winter sky. And so here is, like I was saying, that kind of smaller version of the star chart. And so the Pleiades is found in the constellation of Taurus. And so you can find that V shape of the head of Taurus. And if you just go up and to the right a little bit, you'll find the cluster of stars. And this one can be seen with the naked eye. It is incredibly bright. You can even see it with some moderate light pollution. Um, and it does look like this little grouping of stars. Uh, now it's called the Seven Sisters because on um, a good dark night, you can see generally six to seven bright stars, um, even though we know that there's you know a few thousand there. Um, but yeah, that is an open star cluster of the Pleiades. Now there is a, another type of star cluster, and that is called a globular cluster, and it looks like this. Um, globular because it, it looks really like a glob of stars. Um, but these are much, much more densely packed with stars. We're talking um, tens to hundreds of thousands of stars that are really packed in tight. So they look like this spherical glob. Um, and you'll also see that it tends to have more of a reddish color. And that's because those big, bright blue stars have died already. And so the color comes from the stars that are left, which tend to be redder in color because those live for a longer period of time. So the cluster that we're seeing here is M2. It doesn't have a fancy name like Pleiades. Um, it has another catalog name, NGC7089. Um, but this one is found in the constellation of Aquarius. Um, and so we can see on the star chart here the stars that make up the constellation of Aquarius. And so if you wanted to try and see this one, which um, you might be able to see with very, very super dark sky, so up like at the end of the gun flint, like we talked about on Monday, um, you may be able to see this with your naked eye, but most likely you're going to need binoculars or something. And so you'd want to find this bright star in Aquarius and then look up from it. And that should be where you'll see 
this cluster. All right. So the other type, or another type of object that makes up the Messier catalog are what we call nebulae. Um, this is really just a gas cloud, but they come in a couple of different types. So one of my personal favorite things to look at is um, a nebula or a type of nebula called a star forming region. And it's called that because it's, it's a giant cloud of gas where stars are being born. Uh, it is a stellar nursery. Um, and the most famous one, at least I'm fairly certain the most famous one, is um, M42, which is the Orion Nebula, named because it's in the constellation of Orion. Um, it's actually right here in the sword of Orion that's hanging off of his belt. Um, and so you may sometimes see this like little, what looks like a star in the middle of his sword, and that's, that's actually the Orion Nebula. Um, this is another one that you can see with the naked eye, uh, but you do have to have some decently dark skies to be able to see it. Um, but it's gorgeous, and I love looking at this one through a telescope. All right, another type of nebula is called a planetary nebula, and this is M57, known as the Ring Nebula. Pretty descriptive. Um, now, planetary nebulas, their names are a bit misleading. They actually don't have anything to do with planets. What these are are the gas left over after a lower mass star, something like our sun, died. Um, because when it reaches the end of its life, it kind of puffs up, and those outer layers kind of get blown away um, by winds coming off of the star. And so we're left with all of this gas that's kind of been puffed out and away as the star dies, but it's still pretty hot and so it glows. And so that is um, what a planetary nebula is. Now it was named planetary because when um, astronomers first started looking at them through telescopes, they reminded them of how the planets looked through a telescope, even though they have nothing to do with the planets. And so that's why it's, it's planetary. It's more of a descriptive for how it looks in comparison rather than what it is, if that makes sense. Um, so the ring nebula is one that we can actually find up right now. It's in the constellation of Lyra. Um, it's M57, so it's right here. Sorry, I had to look closely at my screen. Um, and so Lyra is one of the constellations in the Summer Triangle with this really bright star, Vega. And so if you can make out the constellation, you can find the Ring Nebula halfway in between these two stars on one of the sides of Lyra. And this is where I will say why we call these a bit more intermediate. Because for the things that can't be found or can't be seen with your naked eye, you have to be comfortable reading a star map and navigating the sky to be able to know which two stars to look in between and things like that. Um, and that just comes with practice. The more you do it, the better you get at it. All right, our third type of nebula is known as a supernova remnant. And this is what happens when the most massive of stars die. They explode in a giant explosion that we call a supernova. And all of the gas that makes up the star gets violently expelled away in this explosion. And again, it's still pretty hot right after it happens, and so that makes it glow. Uh, and so that gas um, is what we call a supernova remnant. Um, this one here, M1, is the Crab Nebula, one of the more famous supernova remnants, um, because we actually saw the supernova that happens that created it. I don't mean we as in today's astronomers. Um, this happened back in 1054. Um, Chinese astronomers noticed that there was this new guest star in the sky for a few days that slowly faded away. Um, and that ended up being, we believe, the supernova explosion that created the Crab Nebula, which is pretty awesome. Um, this is another one that is found in the winter sky, also in Taurus, just like the Pleiades. But it sits up here near one of the horns of Taurus. All right. Now, the 
Last type of objects that you can find in the Messier catalog are galaxies. And these are actually really interesting because at the time, um, they didn't actually know that these objects were galaxies. Uh, and so they called them nebulae, spiral nebulae, elliptical nebulae, things like that, because they, they thought that they were other objects within our own galaxy. It wasn't until later um, that we figured out the distance to these objects and realized that they were entirely separate galaxies. Um, and so the or one type of galaxy that you can see is a spiral galaxy because it has these beautiful spiral arms. Um, and so again, when this catalog was first made, this was called a spiral nebulae instead of a spiral galaxy. Um, they are tend to be shaped like a disc, like a frisbee. Uh, and so depending on the angle of the galaxy to us, you may see it more kind of circular if we're seeing it face on, or it may be more like a pin if we're seeing it edge on. Um, and this one in particular is uh, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. It's one of the large galaxies that is in our local group of galaxies. Um, so our local group consists of about 60 galaxies um, and M the Milky Way, the Andromeda, and Triangulum are the three largest there. Um, and so Triang er, yeah, Triangulum is named because it's in the constellation of Triangulum, which is a triangle. Um, and so if you find the long point and then move over, you'll find M33 right there. All right, the other type of galaxy that I'm going to highlight is an elliptical galaxy. Um, these, honestly, they look pretty similar to um, the globular clusters. They're just, you know, galaxy sized. Um, and so these are roughly spherical concentrations of hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of stars that are packed kind of in tightly together into this, you know, roughly spherical shape. Um, so this one here is a pretty famous one, M87, um, because it is a huge elliptical galaxy, one of the largest elliptical galaxies. Um, it's a little unusual because we can see this jet of material that's being flung out from the center. And that jet of material is actually being flung out by the supermassive black hole that sits at the center of the galaxy. And in fact, that very famous first image of a black hole that we got, I think it's been a year now, it might have been more, um, time is, flies way too fast, um, but that picture was of the black hole at the center of M87, which is just really awesome. Um, now, M87 is in what's called the um, Virgo cluster of galaxies. And so in the constellation of Virgo, there are quite a lot of galaxies that you can find. Um, it's a really great spot to point your telescope and take a look at what's there. All right, so those are just an overview of the types of objects that you can find. So let's now um, look at specifically what we could find up in the sky tonight. Um, and so the first object that I'm going to tell you about is a globular cluster that is in the constellation of Hercules and is known as the Great Globular <laughs> I messed up the word Great Globular Cluster of Hercules. Um, and it's beautiful to look at. Um, so if you uh, can find the constellation of Hercules here, um, and the trick is to find the backward C of the crown, and then if you connect two stars to turn that C into a spoon, these two stars that you connect are um, the belt stars of Hercules. And so once you found the belt, if you take this side and go up to the next brighter star, um, about eh, three fourths of the way up is where M13 sits. This one is actually pretty bright. 
Um, you can see it with um, your naked eye if you have really dark skies. Um, so again, another thing that if you go out to the end of the gunflint, you could actually see this with your naked eye. It'll look like a little fuzzy blob there. Um, but when you look at it through a telescope, uh, depending on how big the telescope is, you can see the individual pinpoints of the stars that are in the cluster. And the bigger the telescope, the more of those stars you'll be able to resolve, the more you'll be able to see, the more detail you'll see. Um, so through a pretty small telescope, you can still get a decent view as we're seeing here. And it looks, I love it because I think it looks like a shimmery crystal. Um, with all of the light kind of sparkling from all of the stars that make it up. I just, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, so that is M13 right there. Um, another good object to look at is the Dumbbell Nebula, which you can see right here, named such because of its kind of hourglass shape. Um, it kind of looks like a dumbbell or an hourglass, but I guess they went with Dumbbell Nebula. Um, and this one is in, uh, where's it at? Why am I blanking? Oh, right there. Okay, there it is. <laughs> it's near um, Vulpecula, which I know a lot of people don't know, but it's actually right in uh, the summer triangle, which is the three bright stars up in the summer of Vega, Deneb, and Altair. So if you can find the Summer Triangle and you find Deneb and Altair, in between those two, a little bit closer to Altair from halfway is where the Dumbbell Nebula sits. And again, this is the view through a smaller telescope. Um, a larger telescope, it's going to look a little bit bigger. It may not be quite as bright um, because the bigger the telescope, um, it's actually the fainter the object looks, which seems counterintuitive, but it's because the light is being spread out over a larger area. Um, so, but yeah, that's the Dumbbell Nebula, and that's another um, planetary nebula, like the Ring Nebula, which is right here in Lyra, like we saw. So we've got two great planetary nebulas here up in the Summer Triangle. Um, now, over in the south near Sagittarius, we have quite a lot going on because that's right where the lane of our Milky Way is. And so we're looking into the heart of our Milky Way because um, that's the direction to the center of the Milky Way as well. And there are a lot of gas clouds over here, a lot of nebulae over here. Um, one good one is the Lagoon Nebula, which we can see here and looks kind of like this. Um, but my favorite sits a little bit higher up, which is the Trifid Nebula right here. Um, and I just like the kind of mix of the pink and blues that we see from it. I think it's, it's beautiful. Um, now, to your eye, the colors might not be quite as vibrant as this picture has here. I couldn't find information on um, how long uh, the exposure was for this image. Um, it's probably a bit longer than your eye. Um, so again, those colors may not look quite as vibrant to your eye, but it still looks really cool. Um, and so to find either of these, you're going to want to look for the teapot of Sagittarius. So you can see the handle, the kettle, the top, and the spout. And if you just take that spout and just go up from it and follow the lane of the Milky Way up from it, you'll find the Lagoon, the Triffid Nebula, and some other stuff as well. There's lots over here. And then the one we are going to end on is one of, I would say, famous kind of fall, early fall um, objects in the sky, and it's the Andromeda Galaxy. And this is one that you can see with your naked eye. It's pretty bright. Um, and so uh, even, you don't have to have super, super dark skies to be able to see this one, but it's right here. And the trick to finding this one is to actually find the big W of Cassiopeia. And then you use this half of the W as an arrow and it'll point you to the little fuzzy spot that you'll see that is the Andromeda galaxy. 
Now, of course, if you look at it through a pair of binoculars or through a telescope, it's going to look a little bit more impressive than just a little fuzzy dot. Um, you can, depending on how big the telescope is, start to see kind of more of the galaxy, um, may see some structure in there, depending on, again, the size of your telescope. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a brief tour of these Messier objects and some of the um, good ones that you can try and find right now in the late summer um, into early fall. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested, um, a lot of these images that I got for how to find them were actually through the program Stellarium, which I do have linked in the comments or in the description of the video. Um, it's just a tool that uh, mimics what the night sky looks like. And so it's a good way to kind of help you learn how to navigate around um, or kind of set up kind of your plans for your observing that night. It lets you do this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, let me switch back over here. Um, so did we have any questions come in? I'm not seeing any. All right, well, if you do have any questions, now is a great time to ask them. Um, Lindsay, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I mean, yeah, M13 is one of my favorite things to look at for a telescope also. Yeah. So sparkly. It does. I mean, it does, it, it's, it sparkles. Mm -hmm. It's so pretty. Um, it's one that I try to test to see if it would look good over the telescope stream. And I didn't have a lot of success with it um, earlier, but I might try again tonight because we have a gorgeous night tonight. So or it's supposed to be. Um, so I might I might try it tonight. We'll see. Um, speaking of, we are going to have a telescope stream tonight because the weather is supposed to be cooperating for us. Um, so starting in about an hour, about 8.30, we will go live again with a view through our 8-inch telescope. Um, we'll start off looking at the moon and then probably Jupiter. I'll try Saturn again. Um, if you were with us on Monday night when we did this uh, telescope stream, um, you may remember that I struggled to get uh, Saturn to focus because the atmosphere was really turbulent. Um, but I'm going to try it again. We'll see. And then once it gets really dark, we might have fun and try and find some of these other objects that I've been talking about um, and see. We'll see how they look through the stream. I'll try it out. Um, all right. Well, I am not seeing any questions come up. I don't know if mine is delayed. Lindsay, are you seeing any? Oh, I'm not seeing any. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us um, to our concluding night of our virtual dark sky caravan. Starting next week, we will pick up with our regular schedule of shows um, at Wednesdays and Saturdays at seven. And since next week is September, um, we will be doing our uh, beginning of the month shows, kind of telling you what you can expect to see up in the sky in September and the constellations that you can see along with some of the stories involved with them. Um, so we hope to see you again. Um, we hope you have a wonderful night and rest of your weekend and um, we'll see you next time. So bye everyone. Bye.